Welcome to Mind Rolling. This is Raghu Marcus. I'm David Silver. And Raghu, please introduce our special guest. Well, our special guest is very special, Lama Surya Das, and uh, who is someone very, very dear to us and is family, family to us and family to me. And uh, we don't even see each other that often, uh, but uh, the, through the magic of the shared uh, energy that we have had, that the focal point has been uh, Neem Karoli Baba, who we call Maharaji, who you've heard us talk a lot about on these podcasts, that whenever we see each other, there's an automatic recognition of that which has no name. So uh, Suridas has uh, got some wonderful information and, uh, and has disseminated it also through some fantastic books. Uh, David has been studi- studiously... Studying. And judiciously, too. And judiciously. Yeah, okay, that's what I was saying. Thank you. An <laughs> English guy. He's, he's an English guy. Well, I just, I just uh, read um, Buddhist Standard Time. And, uh, as, you know, we've all read like a million of these books. And I have to say that this one did it big to me. And I'm 112 years old and uh, been studying for a while. And the pragmatic, practical, down-to-earth, and yet deep, deep, deep advice and teachings in this are, are great. So before we say anything else, you, should, you know, after you've heard this conversation, just go out and buy this book because it can do you nothing but good, I'll tell you that. And we're right going to take this segment, uh, Surya Das, and we're going to put it up on, on, on your website for this testimonial from David, absolutely. And uh, Thank you. Very <laughs> nice, David. Um, yeah. Now... Uh, I think you have to tell us one thing before we even ask question one. Here's the precursor. Now, um, we, you heard, uh, of course, the name of our podcast, Mind Rolling. What uh, reaction do you have with that name? And we'll tell you how we got it. Um. I felt that it's just a very opening pointer to things that are and could be. And um, if anything, I'd like to, you know, insert the implied word heart and soul in there. Hmm. Hmm. Well, you know what happened is, uh, and this is a, it's a little, I won't make it too big a story, but I ended up, one day, because um, a, a, um, attending a an online workshop, uh, and I went to it, and it was at uh, this monastery, Tibetan monastery in Upper New York State, KTD, and I was attracted by the title of it, uh, which was "Transforming Negative Emotions," and I thought, mm. "Boy, I'm I'm there." And it was a lama named uh, Kandro Rinpoche. Are you familiar with her? Is she uh, the female lama, Kandro Rinpoche? Yes. India? Yes. Yes, she's a wonderful lama. Wonderful yes. lama. Absolutely wonderful. Won- um, it was so ass kicking, ass kicking lama from India. And yeah. woman. Yeah, and a woman. Uh, yeah. I mean, shouldn't and a woman. Even unusual. say it. Yeah, yeah, unusual for the tradition, but not unusual. And for- English speaking. And right. totally speaking. It should spe- be more common. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, just marvelous. But I mean, down to if if we're about anything uh, in terms of anything, David and I want to share through these podcasts. It's as much uh, how much down to earth, uh, practical information we can share about just how to live in a balanced life and be present. I mean, this woman, this Lama, uh, represents that in tea. So I noticed on I went to her site and uh, and then I saw she was known as mind roller Jetson Kundro Rinpoche and then I looked <laughs> and then, so I went wow mind roller wow and I told David I said what about calling this mind rolling he said well what does that mean I, I said I'm gonna go I mean I'll tell you what it means to me it means not getting stuck in any one um, dogmatic thought in your head to be able to keep rolling and moving and, and be open and accepting. I said, that's what it means to me. He said, well, what does it mean? I went up on the net, I, sorry, Das, 
I could not yeah. find a definition of the mind rolling tradition. Once I found a poetic thing and then fortunately lost it about something about being in the garden of, you know, and cultivating blah, blah, blah. I don't even know. And I was hoping that you could blah, tell blah. us. Blah, blah. Let me straighten you out. Okay. Get you out of the thicket, thicket of Tibetan esotericism. First of all, not to correct you, but the Tibetans would call it Mindro Ling. Ling is the name of the monastery or place in Tibet. Uh. And Mindro means liberating spiritual medicine. So it, the notion is that she's from the Mindro Ling monastery tradition and lineage mm. that goes back to her family and her gurus uh, five or six hundred years to teachers of the Dalai Lama, and they teach the direct right. Right. access enlightenment now Dzogchen tradition of Tibetan Buddhism or mystical meditations. Dzogchen, and uh, it's called Mindro Ling. So mm. she has a center called Lotus Gardens in Mindro Ling ah. Retreat Center in Virginia, but she lives mostly, is based in and travels from the Mindro Ling Monastery in Dehradun, northern India. So in short, I think mind rolling is good for us. Kind of like I like the kind of roll and dice kind of you know we'll see what happens. Yeah, exactly. Okay, like there what you we're go. doing now. Yes, what yes. What we're doing now on the airwaves together with yeah. all our listeners. Yes, yes, yes. Now, uh, now one of the other things that we introduced through this podcast originally, uh, there's a couple of con. Uh, yeah, they're very loose. But one thing that we did do was we talked, David and I, when we first started the podcast, we talked about what it was that was our stressors when we were growing up into the 60s and early 70s. What were the stressors that were there culturally, uh, emotionally, politically, um, and spiritually? And how how did we wake up? And we, we talked, you know, we, we parallel each other a little bit. We're both foreigners that came, you know, we're uh-huh. immigrants in America, so that was one of our parallels. But uh, uh-huh. we, uh, we heard we were, we were in a dark place. We were not happy. We knew there was something else. We heard Dylan. I heard Coltrane one night and went out of my body. We, uh, we acid, you know, was the great equalizer to know there was experientially something else other than the senses, etc. And, you know, and then other things started to happen to us, none the least of which, of course, was Ramdas at that time. Can we get you to run through from where you were, happy, sad, 13, 14, 15, 16? What happened to you? Well, um, like everybody, a lot was going on uh, growing up, teen years, and also more generally, collectively. I grew up in the 60s. I was born in 1950, Raghu, so... I know that you're like way older than me. All oh, right, so, yeah, that's you know, right. And so you know, I can still remember those days, unlike you, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> if, you roll, if you do a little, if we do a little mind rolling, you know, it may come up uh, with sevens or sixty-seven or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> I encountered these things in the sixties, and um, I was woken up by folk music and Bob Dylan and uh, John Lennon, and not just the Beatles in their music, but John Lennon's, uh, one of my older friends, a college friend, when I was in high school, turned me on to his writings and his uh, drawings and mm. his his thinking. And um, there was a great loss that he died suddenly and so early, not to mention that he was assassinated, murdered. Yeah. Like there's so many assassination murders in the 60s. There's an age of assassination, not just JFK and RFK, but Medgar Evers and Dr. King yeah. and others. There are too many to mention. It's very sad. And so that was one thing. And another thing was, of course, the um, consciousness revolution and renaissance that came along the post-beat era with music and poetry and the arts and peace movement, anti-Vietnam the politics and so on, mm. including drugs and psychedelics, and then psychedelic music and the message explicit with the words and implicit in the vibes and the subliminal messages and the culture of the communes, et cetera, that that came with. That mm. was very influential. And then, of course, in uh, very early college years, I met Zen Buddhism and went to a retreat in 1968 in Rochester, 
with the first American Zen master, Philip Kaplow, oh, Roshi. Yeah. And I met Ram Das, who had just come back from India, I think, in 68 or yeah. the 67, can't remember. And was in his white clothes, Swami, bearded face, <laughs> and chanting. And he came to my college, University of Buffalo, and I schmoozed and cruised and loved and chanted with him yeah. and hundreds of people. And that was great. And he had been a professor, so he knew how to bring it to us in English, but totally uh, traditional from the Mashram lineage with kirtan and songs to God and devotion and mm. heart-opening, soul-nourishing love, and also very interesting, art- well-articulated um, stories and, and, and uh, songs and love poems and, and stories of the gurus. And that's when I first heard about our guru, my first guru, Nimkaroli Baba, Maharaji, our Baba, mm. who named us both. Yes. Yes. So that was very helpful and, and transformative, and, and some of my friends also went on this went on the journey together. Um, and then I met Allen Ginsberg and others in college, and uh, Gary Snyder heard about India. So when I graduated from college, I went to India to find these things instead of studying them in the graduate school. Yeah. I yeah. should also mention that my best friend's girlfriend, Allison Krauss, age 19, was shot and killed on... In May of 1970, Kent State, when the National oh, really? Guard of Ohio oh, yes. shot and fired on the students who were protesting, just like we all had. Yes. And she was a good friend of mine, and he oh. and she had just been in my bed in college visiting a few weeks ago. And that was a very important turning point in my life. Mm. And I had to really think about things. We weren't going to be here forever and think about where is she and what happens next and what happens if do we die, right. if anything. And what is the meaning of life? And all of these sort of, quote, teenage, but uh, timeless questions that we all at some time or other have to face or answer, even if we put it off to our deathbed, as some people may manage to do. Yes. I don't know how. Yeah. And that really turned my head around, and I realized fighting for peace was a contradiction in terms. Mm-hmm. And I felt moved. I mm-hmm. felt inspired or called to become peace and to find peace and to bring some peace or light into the world if possible. And I was reading... I got turned on by some of my professors and friends to uh, Martin Luther King and um, his mentor at Boston University, Howard, Reverend Howard Sermon, who we can still watch and listen to on the web, on YouTube. Martin Luther King's mentor and turned me on to Gandhi and a little bit on to the Dalai Lama, who wasn't that well-known or well-published then. And I started to think about these things and meditate and do yoga and chant with the Hare Krishnas and again chant with mm-hmm. Ram Das. Mm-hmm. And uh, next thing you know, I was in India, and following my heart, following my nose, sniffing around from one guru to another, and within about six or eight months, met Maharaji, Mm. our our beautiful, loving Baba, Mm. who was all love and all heart, and so loving, and treated us all like his oldest and deepest friends and children. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Never. Uh, it showed that that was possible. Yeah. The people uh, had been there for 40 or 50 years, the old Hindu devotees, and um, whose parents had been part of his sacred circle, his satsang, his spiritual family, the beloved community satsang. And we, hippies or students or professors or whatever we were, were doctors who just rolled up and were looking for something we hardly knew what. He treated us all like like God, like himself, like God's pseudopods. God's <laughs> That's good, God's pseudopods. I love that. <laughs> you know, you know Suri, that's one of the things that really strikes me tremendously is how all of us were introduced to these amazing traditions via the most poppy pop things you could imagine. I got into the whole thing via the Beatles, like everyone else, and via mm-hmm. the, the Who. Because when I heard the Peter Townsend uh, mm-hmm. was, you know, a devotee of Meher Baba. I immediately oh. bought everything that Meher Baba, and I only did it because I was a Who fanatic, you know. <laughs> and and it led me not to India, but to to the practice. And I didn't have, you know, the physical darshan of Maharaji, but very soon after everyone else had it, I was, you know, miraculously thrown with the, 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 those people. But it is interesting to me that whatever the way the cosmos works, it managed to introduce those marvelous men and women via the most down-to-earth thing you can imagine, a 45 single or an LP on a FM radio station, in, in my case in England and then in Boston where I lived, and that it was easy 
in that sense. I mean, I didn't have to read even Alan Watts or Aldous Huxley or anybody or Houston Smith. It was John Lennon, as you put it before. I think that's the biggest miracle of all. That you know, It is a miracle. It's a miracle of love, as Ram Dass called it in his classic book of stories about our guru, Maharaji. Yes. And I was very gratified when and I read it. It's a miracle of big love. Big love and big Maharaji, not just the man who was born in India and died, right. but the big Maharaji who's beyond birth and death. That's always with us. And some people I know are more devoted to him who never met him. Yeah, yes, right. I'm more, I'm more, I'm more um, in light, uh, uh, realized of one with God who, through Maharaji who never met him yeah. than I who met him in person. And Jesus said something like that, wasn't it? Those who, you know, Thomas, you've touched me, but even more yeah, blessed yeah. and more faithful right. are those who, who don't have to touch me and still can receive and believe. Yeah, same thing. So I don't so, want ideal over idealized. that one has to go far to find this big Maharaji or the, the universal guru, the cosmic consciousness, the Buddha within, as we call it in Buddha, in Buddhism, excuse me. <laughs> well, one, one of in the, Buddhism. One of the things that I really loved about the book, and I, I don't want to sound like too much of a psychophant, but I mean this, was the way you articulated all, uh, much of this stuff in terms of presencing and in a very down-to-earth, understandable way so that even someone like me could completely get it. And the way you, you know, put that, the way you constructed that book so that you, uh, you know, the way it works for people who are listening is that there's a chapter and then there's moments and, and little meditations uh, at the end of each chapter which you can easily follow. And they're very simple. But as the book proceeds, and this is what I've just experienced, um, you, it begins to get in your bloodstream heavily that this is not a huge tortuous thing, that if you just follow these breathing and relaxing and smiling and, and kindness, loving kindness, uh, you know, sort of impulses and stay with them and stop the rush and stop the madness and stop the static, you will get there. And it's not that hard, but it does require a little bit of practice. Now, what I wanted to ask you was, Wait, you before, know, before you ask, yeah. because since you just did this thing, we absolutely have to say our new sponsor. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, audible.com. Now, you go and you can get a free copy of Surya Das's latest book, Buddha Standard Time. If you go to audibletrial.com slash podcast. And you take up a uh, 30-day free trial. You can get that book, which is a fantastic book. And uh, that, that's their, their wow. gift to you uh, to, to join up. So, or just go to our website, mindrollingpodcast.com, and you will see where it is that you can link to. So, okay, we, we did that. And, and I'm glad we, you know, and here's a case of doing a sponsorship thing where we couldn't believe any more in the product, okay? Yeah, we like so, it. We uh, like it. Yeah. Ask well, the question. Well, well, what, what, just what I wanted to ask was, when did you, you know, I mean, after the darshan and, and the love and the miracle of love, as, as we all put it, when did you start realizing that the Buddhist tradition, Dzogchen tradition and others, was a very, actually, a, a, a very clear way of articulating to Westerners the techniques the ways to get to the point of being in the present. When did that happen, and how did it first start happening in terms of your For you. For, for you, you. Yeah. yeah, for you. Yeah. Well, um, David, I didn't get it at first. It took a while, because it's, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy to get this uh, self-evident secret that what we seek is right here, the problems we use you elsewhere. But it doesn't take many lifetimes of schlepping to get to nirvana or enlightenment. <laughs> so we don't have to wait until we die and get to heaven, that we can find heaven on earth, nirvana within samsara right here and now in this moment. It took a while to reach the non-dual mysticism that Dzogchen represents, and then further to unravel and unpack it through my own practice or experience of it, and try to bring it back home, bring it down from the rarefied heights of Himalayan mountaintops, bring back down from the rarefied heights of theology, of Buddhology, of mysticism, of non-dual talk, and so forth. Bring down to backyard Buddha, to everyday enlightenment, to integrating with daily life. And it took a while. So in the 70s, I was over in India most of the time, and um, doing a lot of practices and retreats. 
and vows and mantras and all the things we did in monasticism and chanting and studies and, and darshan with the different gurus. And in the 80s, I did two, three-year retreats in my teacher's monastery as a traditional Lama training, you know, a tradition. And then I started to get it, actually, the, the idea of being there while getting there, being here while getting there every step of the way, not waiting. And to realize the timeless time, the eternal moment, right within this horizontal, conventional, changing times, realize the divine time, the sacred time, the holy now, within every moment of horizontal, changing times from past, present, and future, this, this sacred fourth fraction that bisects every moment of mm. the changing times. And to live in the now is, is the ultimate, and to be authentic, and to be authentically oneself. But one has to find one's true self, not just continue one's so-called authentic habits and addictive compulsions. Uh, addiction, uh, Ill, uh, su- uh, disease is the aberration. Health is the natural state, so we can come back to health and find our natural true nature, our, our true self, and, and, and undo this habit of overdoing and these tangled compulsions and addictions. And so that's why, as you mentioned, David, from some of my books, I am try to create some, or recreate, or some you know, distill and, and put forth some basic pissy meditational instructions, like breathe, relax, center, and smile. Like, do, let, nothing more to do, just let go, let come and go, let be. One of the That's ones the that... Secret, sorry. Being there while getting there, every step of the way, not waiting. So it took me 10 or 15 years to experience it myself. I had some epiphanies along the way, and so-called enlightenment experiences, or epiphanies, breakthroughs. And then another 5 or 10 years of uh, thinking about it, meditating on it, and before I started teaching it, around 1990, when I was invited to do so. Hmm. You know, Ramdas often says you don't know how spiritual you are until you have to be with your family for a couple of weeks or in the supermarket behind an old lady who can't get her money out of her thing. And you have this this expression, wow, wishing others well. And when I read that, it all, you know, I can't, it wasn't, it was just so obvious to me. But, you know, it's something we don't do much of the time is just wish others well. And you say in the book, the rewards are there. You don't do it for the rewards. It's unconditional, the miracle of unconditional love. But talk to us a little bit about the simple beauty and blessing of wishing others well. Would you do that? Well, I, I coined the anagram um, wow, wishing others well. It's really based on uh, Buddha's own practice and heart practice called metta, or loving kindness, friendliness, benevolence, well wishing. Not just loving kindness, but benevolence, well wishing. Kind of like we wish for our children or our neighbor's children, hopefully, but maybe we don't feel for everybody we see every day. Mm-hmm. So trying to widen and deepen that circle and that well of well wishing and benevolence. And it, it, it helps a great deal um, in our way through life to open our heart. You know, love is not from coming, doesn't come, especially from outside, love comes through loving. So this is a practice of cultivating and generating and doling up the deep wells of love and caring and connection and appreciation and friendliness to the world, to the animate and inanimate world, not just the people we know with human beings, and to all beings, human and otherwise, because they're all endowed with the innate Buddha nature or the inner light, sacred divinity at heart, and um, respecting and loving that. So this wishing of as well is a great practice that we can carry to life, not just sitting and radiating loving kindness, wishing others happy and peaceful and ease and well and relief from suffering, but actually taking off the cushion into life so it starts to become our sort of gesture of awareness. Our heart responds naturally in that way when we see the squirrels in the street or birds or dogs and cats. Well, I'm a dog person, so not so much cat. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> but in general, with one taste, you know, equal to all, that's a very important component that goes with and supports the loving kindness practice, not just loving those who love us, you know, right. which is conditional, transactional, kind of like, I'll love you if you love me. Come on, you first. <laughs> no, because it's in our highest self interest to be loving anyway, as every sage throughout the ages has said. It's like virtue is its own reward. That's not just a cliche. The virtue of loving kindness and caring and warm-hearted compassion is just so good for us and healing to what ails us. Not mm. physically, tension, 
and, and fear and all that, but also healing the gap between us and others so we can recognize the underlying interbeing, interconnectedness, oneness of us all. Mm. So it's a beautiful practice. And Buddha himself said there were 11 great benefits of loving kindness, and I'm not going to run them all down, mainly because I can't remember them. Mm. <laughs> but one of them is happiness. Another one is a beatific faith. And a third one, very important, as my mother said, is you lose the wrinkles in your face. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So even Buddha had a very practical outlook yes. to friends with benefits. I mean practices with benefits. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Better than Botox. Yes. Yeah, right. um, if you look at Sharon Solberg, the Metama, the yeah. um, mother of loving kindness press in this country, her face has almost no wrinkles, as my mother <laughs> yeah. would like to point Abs- out. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. So, uh, Surya Das, uh, one of the other um, premises that this podcast addresses is um, the connection between what is going on right now with uh, the the twenties, thirties generation, and we're we're. Uh, comparing it to this, our generation and what we grew up in. And, you know, there's a lot of similarities. The war is a big similarity. There's a lot of economic stressors now, even more than what we had. And, and certainly society is way opened up much more so there's, uh, you know, than it was with us then. So, but there are some really comparable stressors that lead people to try and uh, experiment, find out about, uh, whatever it is they can to to get more balance in their life. And um, what do you, do you, you know, you go around the country, I know you teach a lot, and I'm sure you're getting that generation of people uh, that are coming to you, and I, uh, you have personal experience there. What What is your feelings about people of this, this what they, by the way, this uh, generation is called echo boomers, because they're the t- <laughs> that's the term. Mm. So, have you met any echo boomers lately? And what do you think? There, you know, is there some real aspiration that that is comparable to that gener- that huge change that happened in consciousness, late sixties, early seventies? Well, I think of them as a text generation, but now I know what they're called. I feel better. I guess I have met some of them, um, but I thought of them as a text generation or the <laughs> I generation. Yeah, the I generation. Yeah, that's I right. Yeah. You know? But uh, I'm waiting for I'm waiting for Steve Jobs, the late Buddhist wizard, to give us the no iPad, yeah. the selfless <laughs> iPad, the selfless <laughs> iPhone, the Buddhist, Great. the Buddhist connection. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, interesting you should say is because the Dalai Lama a few years ago, when I introduced him at a big gathering at my alma mater, University of Buffalo, uh, while we were waiting before we were going on, and as it happens, I first met him and I've known him. And, that he's under him somewhat since 1972. He said to me, uh, American lamas, he always called me Niji Lama, you should not just teach meditation, start bringing it to the campus and the young people. It's not enough just to pray and meditate today. We must have compassionate action and make a difference in the world in these difficult times, help the world. So I've been turning my attention to a little more compassion and action and social activism, social spiritual, I should say, spiritual activism, bodhisattva activity, enlightened leadership, and the young people. Mm. And what he, I think it's not really the time necessarily to be bringing religion to the campuses. Even the, the college students aren't on campuses. They're online. Yeah, they're So online. I've been bringing it online and uh, thinking about this, and I'm delighted Raghu and you guys and, you know, the many who are doing this, we're all doing this together. Uh, very important today to be awakening together. Bring it online and the new media and whatever. Of course, it's been said that the prana or the energy is exceedingly thin in cyberspace. Mm. But it's a good Dharma gate. It's a good way to connect and people can pursue it more deeply if they wish to. And so I think um, through the modern media, we should try to bring a little bit of the higher and higher conscience back into higher education. And through webinars and podcasts and uh, conscious haiku-like Twitters and, and that wise maxim and sayings on Twitter and Facebook, not just telling people which kind of cereal you're eating in the morning, mm. we can really do that and start to encourage the young people 
who were on at all hours. They're not really in real time. You know, at four in the morning, they get their message from they get their message from the Love Serve Remember Foundation. So open the heart and love the one you're with. As it says in the song, that's mm. a great message for them to get. And uh, my nieces and nephews and godchildren don't even open their email very often anymore. So yeah. <laughs> they need to be texted. So I'm texting them those messages now. Really? So I think it's a good time to be turning our attention to the younger generations, which I consider everybody under 40, since yeah. I'm 61. Yes. But of course, the under 20s, or whatever the echo boomers are, they are echoing a lot of the things that we were echoing, including threat of global devastation. We feared it from nuclear holocaust. Yeah. We used to hide under desks to protect ourselves. That's how little we understood that. Hmm. Now we are struggling to understand and believe in the issues of environmental degradation and global environmental danger and um, hmm. ter global terrorism and pandemics, you know, biochemical warfare and right. so on. So these are fearful t times for young people. And of course the economic stress and not getting jobs and also I think they're starting to also look, I mean, they're very interested in this. There's a great hunger for these things, even if people can't name it. It's certainly not religion they're looking for because of being disillusioned with institutionalized religions right. and religious and political leaders and big shots. But there's a great hunger for real connection. So many college kids I know take a year off or as soon as they graduate, they do a year interning in, in some kind of uh, ecological project. Or, you know, our friend Grace Lesser is in uh, Uganda working for the poor people in a medical charity, yeah. having just graduated from Wesleyan College in Connecticut. So these are beautiful kids. And the truth is, every time I hear the news, I could be sad or even depressed. The news is generally so depressing. But mm. every time I meet the young people, I look in, at their eyes. I, I irrationally feel hope mm. and, and re-inspired. So I have no rational explanation for that, but I'll go with hope and re-inspiration. And re yeah, absolutely. Feed that. I'll feed that animal and not be one of sadness and, yeah. and uh, discouragement. Right. Which is a, a tremendous uh, good point. Animal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, we're we're certainly uh, on the same page uh, about all of this. Absolutely. We were turned on to even do this podcast uh, by a young man who is a comedian in Los Angeles. Get this. He's a comedian in Los Angeles. His name is uh, Duncan Trussell. And he's wildly funny, but he picked up on Ramdas just like we did uh -huh. way back when, and he got in touch. Uh -huh. You know, as uh, I guess everybody, uh -huh. not everybody may know, but I'm also involved with the Love Serve Remember Foundation, and David it is uh -huh. David is as well. And uh, so he got to me and he said, "You guys should do Ramdas should do a podcast. Why don't you do something? You introduce uh, uh, your uh, tell a little of your story, and then you know get get uh, you know some of his talk." So I started doing. This from uh, from his desire to see this happened, he wanted something, you know, and he expressed. He said, "I have thirty thousand, forty thousand, I think it is, yeah. people a month, uh, every week rather, that are uh, streaming my or downloading my podcast that would be interested. They want to know. They're in their twenties and their thirties, and they want to know. They want some information, and so on. So that was, and then of course we we came to deciding David and I would would share some stuff as well. But it was he. Let me tell you." He invited me to do a podcast. I was in Los Angeles on his podcast, which is, you know, it's got a lot of different things going on, but some of it he throws in conscious stuff. He had one podcast, for instance, that he talked about. I think we've mentioned this again. It's, you know, it, it's so it's weird. Almost, we got to so keep mentioning crazy. it. Crazy. Yeah. Unwanted hair that became a whole thing about Aldous Huxley. So he's, you can get an idea That's of great. where he's at. Yeah. Anyhow, I went in there, Surya Das, he had a small house in, in uh, you know, uh, Echo Park or something in, in Los Angeles. I walk in the door, there's a living room with a couch and a couple of chairs and a table, no pictures. There was one picture, Neem Karoli Baba, a big mm. picture of Maharaji in the room. And a bong. Maybe that was it. That's all he had, you know. Mm -hmm. And he sat me down, and he he 
as everything he did was uh, was took me back 40 odd years before when I was r- the program director of the radio rock and roll station in Montreal and 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 I met Ramdas that way and got him on the air and did the same thing asked him everything that I wanted to know about trying to be here you know be here now is what it became and this guy Duncan did the same thing then. I was so blown away of the full circle of it, so it led to to these podcasts. So I, we we are absolutely on the same page uh, about that. Um, I I just well, want to I want to ask something that has nothing to well has everything to do with what we're talking. Yeah, everything about. is connected, and you know, of course, Maharaj follows you everywhere. So how could it not be? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You but um, I, uh, you mentioned, you know, spending time, and I know this, uh, of course, uh, uh, with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and you know, uh, I have said on a previous webcast that uh, of of anyone who is alive today. He is the greatest human being, human being alive today, period, that I have ever met. And uh, uh, and uh, why don't you talk a little bit about, just give us some little nuggets of experience of hanging out with this being, off, not about teachings, but about the humanity. It's what, and, and there, uh, you know, I'll just digress for one second. But we, Surya Das and I and David, you know, know, had a, and Surya Das and I particularly, and I'm not even quite sure of how far this goes, but we had a mentor who was close. He's one of those people that Surya, talk, Surya talked about that was, was with Maharaji 50 years before we got there. And his name was Dada Mukherjee, and he was an economics professor at Allahabad University. And he used, took us into his house, and he put us, you know, he got us to Maharaji. He translated, he made it like, you know, he, we were in front of him. There was no way that we weren't in front. That's, we were God. And he put us in front. And uh, later on, after Maharaji left, and he used to say, I, you know, and he tells story after story after story. And he, the stories were about, not about the miracles, not about the power. They were about the humanity and the com- love and compassion he used to talk about. Can you talk about that with His Holiness, about your experiences? Well, I'd love to. Uh, and by the way, Raghu, I met Maharaji at Dada's house. No, in, I didn't uh, know that. January or February of 1972, right around Holy. Yes. Right, we were all there. Um, yes, we were we in were that compound. There, That's right. That's where we met. Yes. Was sleeping at the other place. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh my God! Was with the paint bombs coming over the walls. Yeah, it was the holy festival. Yeah, a I mean, colorful board balloon festival. Yeah, to put it roughly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yes, my Dada is was the late Dada was a wonderful mentor and and father figure and uh, translator bridge access points for us all. A real buddy side for a real um, selfless yeah, server absolutely. of the higher, the high, serving the highest by serving even the lowest. Yep, there you go. A real embodiment of saver service, mm. um, and I loved him a lot. He's a beautiful. Even two days ago, I was telling some of my students about him and how he walked around uh, in his totally in his natural outfit as a Brahmin Indian, not trying to dress like a holy man or a modern person dressing just like he would have at home with his wife and his mother-in-law and, and with his Indian cloth and his little black vest and his mm. cigarettes in the pocket mm-hmm. and his spectacles. But the point I want to get to with all of this dress talk is he always had a little towel, like a wash rig or a yeah. towel over, not a wash rig, over his shoulder, wide, to fan Maharaji and to keep off the mosquitoes. Yeah. So that was like his way of being just mm. to serve and to be ready to serve. Even walking around with a little towel on your shoulder, I know it sounds silly, but I'm talking about walking around his house now. Perhaps he didn't wear it in the economic department at the mm. University, or I think he was chairman for some time. Yeah. Um, but he, that was his, his, his mudra. That was his position in life, where he put himself as the right-hand person, as the server, as the portal, as the introducer as a translator, and he brought us so close. And I met Maharaji one-on-one in a bedroom mm. in Dada's house with mm. Dada translating, and that's where he gave me my name. So right. wow. him and people like him have been doing this for a long time at the sacred 
um, work. And I suppose the story of Martha and Mary, I, I guess it's Martha that served so much in Jesus' life, uh, may come to mind when you think of Dada. The Dalai Lama is like that, too. Mm, he's a us. great bodhisattva. We wouldn't say he's a Buddha, although it's fine if we want to say he's enlightened or whatever. And I'll certainly vote for him being, you know, the sterling icon or a sterling icon of all the splendid spiritual virtues and enlightened virtues on this planet today. They may be, there certainly are others. Um, he definitely stands out. Bodhisattva, server, mm. server of all, selfless server, giving of oneself. And he's just so humble. The first time I met him, not to harp on how old I am, but <laughs> maybe more how, what a slow learner I am. In 72, what struck me in my personal meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in his living room in Dharamsala, India, where the Tibetan government in exile is located in the foothills of Himalayas in northern India since China conquered Tibet in 59. The Dalai Lama, his interview room alone with him sitting on a couch with only one monk present sitting on the floor helping to translate, even though His Holiness speaks English. Mm -hmm. What struck me the most, and I was 21 years old, and I hardly knew which end was up, even less than now. It's hard to believe, but even less than now. I never knew what was going on in India in those days, but somehow I had the grace to be immersed in it all. And what struck me the most was his incredible humility and humanness, like heart-to-heart, -heart, mm. total presence with me, as if I was the most important person in the world. Wow. wow. And I had come with a little letter of introduction from my first Lama, Lama Tukta Nyeshe, the first Tibetan Lama to teach Westerners in Nepal and India. And certainly that got me in the in. But I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have any resume. And I wasn't Richard Gere, a great, a famous benefactor of the Tibetans or anybody like that. And um, his total attention and uh, his humility, his warmth, his caring, his asking about who I was and where I came from and what religion my parents were. Well, I told him I was a Buddhist and was studying with lamas and meditating and all. But before I left, he thanked me for being a sincere student of Buddhism and practitioner of meditation and yoga. And he said, this was a quote, I don't have much time for that now. I'm so busy with my job and role on behalf of the Tibetan people in exile. But when I retire, I hope to get back to that full time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, I don't, I don't think, I, I almost couldn't walk out of there. I kind of mm. oh. mind rolled down the hill at that <laughs> monastery. I'll tell you, about mind rolling. Oh. I was mind boggled. Wow. Yeah, wow. I hope to get back to that. So thank you for doing that for us all. Mm. <laughs> like, what could be more humble than that? Talk no. about, you oh, know. Oh, Jesus. Wow. Upside oh. down and inside out. I mean, mm. so humble, so beautiful, and wow. so human. Mm. Oh, that's just, uh, that is pure grace to be able to spend that kind so of time. So that's always been an inspiration. Yeah. Whatever other his great qualities of wisdom and, and um, social activism and vision and other things, and the tolerance and openness and interfaith efforts and human rights initiatives and so on, just his incredible humility and wealth. And so many people have said that, that he's felt so present. Well, when he leaves the hotel and he asks them to line up the staff and he walks yeah. down the line and shakes everybody's hand, including the doorman and the janitors and everybody, not just the management, yeah. Yeah. and looks at one by one and bows to them or whatever, one by one, slowly, attentively, people say, the doorman at a hotel that I know well in Austin, Texas, near my retreat center, so to ranch outside Austin, George, he said, the Dalai Lama, he told me, Lama, the Dalai Lama shook my right hand. He held out his right hand, his dark colored right hand. He said, I didn't wash it for a few days. <laughs> oh, he shook weird. my hand and he looked at me, and I didn't wash it for a few days, the doorman said. Mm, that's so sweet. Wow. Um, well, we're, we're just, uh, we're near the close of our uh, podcast, but... Um, can we get from? Do you have something? Because you you well, look like you're itching there. To I, well, there's just say something, something that that, that Surya Das quoted in his book, which I think sort of summarizes his book in a very beautiful way. It's a Rumi quote, mm. and the quote just knocked me out. Is this? Come out of the circle of time, and into the circle of love. 
And I think this 45 minutes with you, Suridas, has really affected me deeply, and I'm very, very grateful for you talking to us. Suridas, give us yeah. one little, uh, just give us one little kernel of, uh, of what you have uh, garnished after all these years uh, in the, what would be your most uh, down-to-earth, common-sense kernel that, that uh, could be given to all of us, including those of us that have been practicing for supposedly a long time and those of us who may have, this is their first time even hearing about the possibility of becoming happy. I think I like what Thich Nhat, the great Thich Nhat Hanh of Vietnam has said, that there is no way to happiness and peace. Happiness and peace is the way. And I think mm. making that our way is the way. And I'll add on to that my own version or redaction, as I said before, as I slipped in, the Zog Channel direct access, non-dual mystical approach, being there while getting there every step of the way, not waiting, mm. being totally here while mm. getting there every step of the way, not waiting for some fabled pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Every step of the way is the great golden rainbow way. Mm. And if we're not here now, we'll never be there then. That I can guarantee. Yeah. So <laughs> presence and yes. awareness and open heart, being mm. here while mm. getting there every step of the way, not waiting, not procrastinating, not putting it off, not waiting till after we die or any other story. Now, it's now or never, as always. Mm. Well, we really appreciate you, Surya Das, and uh, we. You know what? I can't think that this. That we have to talk again soon, one of these I'd days. Be glad to. Absolutely, because this is just exactly what we want to share. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna we're going to sign off, mind rollers that uh, we uh, aspire to, and this is mind rolling podcast. Go to mindrollingpodcast.com, dot com. Go to audible trial dot com slash mind rolling podcast and get Surya's new or fairly new book. But never mind, new or not new, it's uh, it's 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 something that can really help us all. So thank you again, and uh, we see you soon, Baba. My pleasure. And today's World Peace Day, I heard. Ah. Elton John is singing in New Central Park here in New York, so I hope everybody will practice uh, being peace and happiness, not waiting for it or fighting for it. God bless, Buddha bless, and love to you. Love. Raghu and David. Thank love to you. Bye-bye.